This is the Berlin middle-class suburb of Lichtenrader. It was a conservative sort of area at the best of times, and particularly so in the late 1930s, with the Nazis controlling the building authorities. And yet this is where we've come to look for one of the masterpieces of modern architecture. This is it. It's the Moormann House, which Hans Scharoun built in this Berlin suburb in 1939. Now, from what we can see from the street, it might seem almost unbelievable that we're even considering this in our course on modern architecture, with its pitched roof, its dormer window, and its generally arts and crafts appearance. It looks as if it might belong better to the beginning of the period than to its very last year. Well, I am going to look at it, and in some detail, and for two main reasons. Firstly, I think the interior is probably one of the best living spaces of any of the houses we'll have seen in these house programs. And secondly, I think it serves to remind us of a strand in the development of modern architecture which is too often undervalued and ignored. Well, we're going to come back to this house later in the program. But first, I want to look at some of the characteristics of Sharoon's earlier development. The first thing to remember is his expressionist phase, just after the First World War, which left him with a free and artistic sketching technique which lasted all his life. In those dark and desperate days after the war, as the young Sharoon was struggling to discover his artistic personality, enthusiasm was all. A thousand possibilities pour out from our fantasies. Our burning willpower should rage with fever tonight to unite with the primitive impulse of the masses. Then again would building be rooted in the life of the people, crowned in the purity of the beyond. Blood and will is everything. With hot-blooded impulses, we must pour out forms into eternity, molding them out of the primeval mass. Eternity is not outside us, not a star which we can drag down to earth, but instead dwells inwardly, intimately in each emotion of the artist's fantasy, creating we are gods, in calculation, sheep. Now how could this Nietzschean rhetoric of Sharoon's give way to the calculations of the international style? The Breslau Exhibition of Domestic and Industrial Architecture, 1929. How was the world of godlike creativity to be transformed into the realities of the standard flat, the existence minimum, the mass-produced fittings and tonne chair? However functional the flats might appear, Sharoon made sure that formal richness and sculptural articulation would not be lost in the whitewash. Restraint and self-abandon. The open-air terrace and veranda could hardly be more freely curvilinear, creating the fundamental contrast required to offset the rows of flats. And yet, if this is sculpture, it's a sculpture employing the materials and aesthetic of the international style quite legitimately. The aesthetic is consistent, shared by the exhibition poster, designed by another ex-expressionist, Johannes Molzahn. And in the Berlin Siedlungen and Weissenhof films, we've already seen buildings by Sharoon in Stuttgart and Berlin, in which the language of the international style is mixed with a curvilinear richness which marks them out from the hardline functionalism of some of his colleagues. From 1932, the German members of Siam began an exodus from the homeland, like leaves before the storm, harried and threatened by the Nazis. And yet it was in 1933, the year that the Bauhaus was finally closed down in Berlin, that Sharoon began work on one of the last great glories of the international style in Germany not, to be sure, in Berlin or any provincial capital, but in the provinces, in the small industrial town of Lobau 
in Saxony. The client who was prepared to risk the disapproval of the authorities was the wealthy industrialist Fritz Schminke. Here we find the same exuberant use of steel and glass for sheer sculptural enjoyment. Since his youth, watching the great ocean-going liners docking at Bremerhaven, Sharoon had been obsessed with marine architecture. The plan at ground floor level reveals an almost completely open space. On the west side, near the entrance, is the kitchen and dining area, opening off a double-height staircase hall. From this staircase, we reach a bedroom corridor running along the north side. The subsidiary bedrooms are compact and neat. The master bedroom has the benefit of the spectacular cantilevered balcony which overlooks the valley. Sharoon has splayed out the bedroom and living room balconies to face the view, providing an exciting mixture of sunny and shaded areas. What looks quite informal and open on the plan is exploited for its contrapuntal, three-dimensional contrasts on the exterior. Steel structure used as a technique of lyricism. I want to take you through the house now, from the front door, through the staircase hall and living room, to the glazed winter garden at the east end. This is the view from the dining area to the front door. It's visible on the far right. The staircase hall is spacious. Notice the use of painted planes to bring out the dramatic upper wall of the hall and the curve of the stairs. We are now looking back towards the living room. Note the projecting spotlights on the brackets illuminating the hall and one of the many porthole windows on the right. From here, the space opens directly into the living room. The living room is opened on both sides and, at the end, the extraordinary winter garden is canted round to the left. On the right, there's the angled greenhouse window, which saturates a deep flower bed with sunlight. Note the marble floor and the banks of radiators. Mies van der Rohe's chairs have rarely had a more perfect setting. We're now looking back towards the living room. Sharoon's method of manipulating the open space of his structure is significant. He uses electric lighting more boldly than any other international style architect to distinguish the separate areas. At night, the effect is most impressive. In the living room, the ceiling is marked out into circular reflector zones which focus the light in pools around the room as required for different functions. The Schmincke House must be classed with Mises' Tugendhat House and Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie as among the most supremely confident and aesthetically mature examples of the international style. Of course, these were sophisticated, moneyed clients, happy to show off their good taste and wealth to all who came to see. But in the decade of Nazi power, this display of international style luxury was going to be impossible. Six years after Schmincke, the Schaff House comes as a complete contrast. The Nazi-controlled building authorities demanded that architects should strengthen the public image of a deeply rooted Teutonic traditionalism. It's similar to the kind of modernized vernacular we saw in the 1890s in the architecture of Voise and Mackintosh. The house is set back from the street and is rather conventional and reserved. On the side of the house, there's greater simplicity and openness. The two large studio windows could almost qualify as one huge glass wall, but they're conceived in the tradition of brick construction, spanned by segmental brick vaults. In this pre-war photograph, 
you can just see the tops of these studio windows above the landing. What makes the interior so much more spectacular than the exterior is the treatment of space. The centre of the house is spanned by a single vaulted ceiling with a great exposed wooden A-frame structure. The stairs on the left are lit by a double-height window of rather medieval, small-paned and tinted glass. The open planning is continued. The screens on the right, dividing the hall from the sitting room, can be slid back to match the open space above the stairs, which, with their curving handrails, join the two levels in a smooth transition. This great space is enlivened by a rhythmic play of freely drawn curves. The curve on the left follows the progress of another staircase that goes up to the bedrooms. The main staircase leads to the office at the mezzanine level. This is a further extension of the open space. It faces onto the garden through these big triple windows which dominate the block on the right. To the left of the window, a massive chimney marks the angle between this block and the rest of the house. The view from the office was carefully calculated to show off the best aspect of the garden. The fireplace is cut away by a sequence of razor-sharp arches and there is a typically Sharoon row of portholes cut into the brick. Originally, as we've seen, the opening to the hall was much wider. It used to be about eight foot across. On the other side of the hall, on the first floor, there is now a partition where it was originally open right through to the studio. You can still see the A-beam structure embedded in the partition and, through the door, a glimpse of the continuation of the barrel vaulted ceiling. A subsequent subdivision of the space is particularly unfortunate at ground level where the sliding partitions have been blocked off by a monstrous abstract photographic blow-up. The whole impact of seeing right through from the hall to the winter garden has been destroyed. In this photograph, taken when the tropical plants in the heated winter garden were less well grown, you can see the full extent of the wall of glass facing the garden. The sitting room window is angled out into the garden to catch the evening light. At first floor level, the angle provides space for a balcony for the studio, while below, on the veranda, you can sit out in the afternoon sun with the sitting room window open behind you. The garden is brought right into the house, literally, with the sunken winter garden, which is at the same time part of the sitting room. Look how arts and crafts-like this low window is, enclosing rather than opening out. At the other end, a gentle arch frames the French windows to the breakfast patio. Above, there's a circular reflecting ceiling light, rather like the ones which we've seen in the Schmincke house. We're going to look now at the various techniques Sharoon used to articulate space in this house. The whole idea of sinking this pool into the corner of the sitting room is carried further by his use of rough stone flags which run from the veranda outside right into the house. The free organic form of these natural flagstones seems to echo the freedom with which Sharoon laid out his internal spacing. If you can think away the partitions which today block the sitting rooms off from the hall, you can conceive in your mind's eye what a consistent and carefully considered plan this is. This breakfast patio is another extension of the sitting room and it's partly screened off from the street by this rather Chinese opening which forms a bold motif on the reticent front facade. Notice how Sharoon draws attention to it by slicing across it with a triangle of brick. From here, too, you get the impression of an easy, intimate open space penetrating through the body of the house. Let's look more closely at how Sharoon engineered these effects of spatial continuity and development. Starting at the front door, we enter a small vestibule 
at right angles to us, forcing us through a narrow space into a small waiting room. This area is within easy reach of the kitchen and servants' quarters. From this restricted entrance area, we suddenly enter the very wide open space in which the hall and living room may be opened into each other or screened off, depending on the occasion. The office is placed off the landing so that it can also be opened right into the public space of the house or closed off as required. From the office, the stairs led up to the studio room on the upper floor, also opening into the central public space of the house with the ever-present screens. The bedrooms tucked away on the entrance front above the kitchen. Now there's an explanation for all this. Scharf owned an important collection of modern painting and sculpture. By adjusting the screens, he could increase the private character of the house or make it into a semi-public space to display his paintings and hold receptions. Although the Mormon house is obviously a much smaller building, the plans show many similarities to the Scharf house. Note the way the little study is canted round at an angle to face into the evening light and the way the main rooms open into each other in the most free-flowing, subtle way imaginable. Very little of the impact of the plan of the Mormon house can be seen from the exterior. As with the Scharf house, Sharon had to fit in with the Nazi concept of what a house should look like so that it wouldn't disrupt the village-like atmosphere of the suburb. Sharon took to the vocabulary of Teutonic vernacular architecture like a duck to water. It has always been an axiom of Sharon's organic theory that the house must be closely tied to the land. He was skillful in exploiting the use of traditional builder's materials for colour and texture. But this sensitive interpretation of traditional forms does not make a house a masterpiece of architecture. What does, as with the Schaff House, is the interior. From the front door, we come into a tiny version of the stair hall of the Schaff House. Let's look at the plan to see how these spaces work. From the staircase lobby, you either step straight into the living room or go up a few steps to your left and into the raised music area. Opening off these spaces is the study, which is balanced by the semicircular projection of the dining area, accessible from the kitchen. The dining bay acts as a hinge about which the whole plan seems to turn. And then there's the children's room, and at the end of the house, a small, self-contained flat. The difference of scale between this house and the Schaff or Schmincke houses is quite clear. But on this reduced, cottagey scale, Sharon still managed to treat the space in a fluid and open way. The view towards the living room on the left is enriched by the sculptural treatment of the fireplace and the surprise of seeing the raised music area behind. This was Mormon's study. We're going to find in a lot of the rooms in this house that the spaces were created around specific functions needed by individual members of the client's family. Here, Mormon could work facing the garden in a space which was flowing into the main living areas, but at the same time separate. He could even decide, for instance, whether he wanted to open this shutter to the veranda where his family would be in the summer. The projecting study wing helps to frame the veranda, which is sheltered by a deep overhang. On the left, the semicircular bay of the dining room encloses it on the other side, pushing the interior space out into the garden. As at the Schaff House, 
This inside-outside relationship is symbolically expressed in the continuity of the same rough stone flags from the veranda right into the living room. This fireplace is really the centre of the whole space on the ground floor. It acts as a sort of hinge between this raised level and the main sitting rooms facing the garden. There's the sitting room proper, and then the semicircular dining room beyond it, and beyond that, the children's playroom. Sharon was always extremely careful about the way he lit his houses. In addition to the way he placed his windows very carefully, he also built in hidden lighting, like this little spotlight here with a diffuser ground glass screen. From the study, you can see how calculated Sharoon's effects are. There are three lots of linked curves, all in their different planes. There's the fireplace, there's the curve of the arch over my head, and there's the curve balancing it in the music room of the window. This whole elevated area here was a music room. It was designed to house a grand piano, which was under the window on this wall here. We've seen how the study was Herr Moormann's work area. On the other hand, Frau Moormann was allotted a window seat of her own, with built-in drawers to hold her sewing materials. Here, she was supposed to sit with her work, taking pleasure from her view of the garden. Do you remember in the Sharp House, there was one window where Sharoon arranged a special uh, plant uh, trap, like a sun house almost, with tropical plants growing up inside? Well, here there's a similar one, but rather smaller. The present occupants of this house uh, keep pieces of driftwood and shells and stones and the like. And in a sense, I think this is a symbol of the kind of quality which I think Sharoon achieves in this house. The floor, for instance, of natural stone with uh, irregular shapes, that's one kind of organic nature. This wall, on the other hand, starting from a very narrow point and growing up, is very solid, very firm, it's a very powerful statement. That, in a sense, is another kind of organic form. I said at the beginning of the programme that I wanted to look at this house because it represented a strand in the development of modern architecture which was different to the international style. The organic strand, in fact. And I think we've seen enough here in the kind of free-form curves, the use of natural materials, the interlocking of spaces, to see what Sharoon meant by organic architecture. In a sense, it doesn't seem to matter in this house, that the date of it was 1939, that the Nazis were in power, that modern architecture was everywhere on the run. Somehow, this interior has dated less than almost any of the house other houses we've seen. 